Good evening, church. Uh, we <clears throat> um, we really had um, a very interesting Bible study class uh, this Wednesday. Uh, unfortunately, in the middle of uh, the Bible study, the internet Wi-Fi went low, so it was not possible for the um, recording machine to record the the whole session. So the internet is improved now. So I'm going to go through what we have already uh, discussed, except that um, you will not be privileged to hear the the uh, contributions of um, all the, the leaders that uh, helped us in, in their comments to explain to us, like uh, Professor Amana, Elder Asma Kago, uh, Elder Obeng, and uh, Sister Kadija Kago. Um, we, we, we just thank God that uh, you are still able to bring what we have already discussed before you. So, um, can we just pray? Father, we thank you, o Lord. For giving us the opportunity to reenact what we have discussed this evening, O Lord. For that, please anoint your message and let my tongue, O Lord, and give us uh, the opportunity to know more and develop a relationship with you. And thank you, Lord, in the name of your Son Jesus Christ, Father, we pray. Amen. We have been studying the book of uh, uh, James for a long time now, and uh, we are on uh, chapter 4. Uh, we finished at, at uh, chapter 6 to 7. So tonight we are going to start with uh, chapter 7 again, which dealt actually with um, a very important uh, subject or a, a moral, moral uh, virtue, which is humility. Like uh, we said, uh, the, the prayer point uh, was, um, on, on this Wednesday night, intercessory prayer, was centered on humility. And I thank Lady Madonna for praying about humility within the church. And what does humility does? What does it really mean? Uh, according to um, Apostle James, he said, "Humility cures worldliness. Humility cures worldliness." And I'm going to read uh, from uh, chapter four, verses seven to. In verse 17. It said, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Then verses 11 to 12 is, Do not judge a brother. Do not speak evil of one another. Brethren, he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother, speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? There was a starting to 17 this which do not boast about tomorrow. <coughs> Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, <clears throat> spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. He said you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boastings is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good 
and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now in that chapter 7, or I mean, verse 7 of that chapter 4 of uh, the book of James, we had where the uh, apostle was writing about uh, <clears throat> the solution to strife, which is in humility. What is the solution to strife? Because we have been talking about strife within brothers in the, in the, in the Christian community. And what is the solution for strife? In humility, get right with God. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, but he gives more grace. What does it really mean? The same Holy Spirit convincing us of our compromise will also grant us the grace to serve God as we should. And this wonderful statement, but he gives more grace, stands in strong contrast to the previous words. One, note that that contrast note is always observe how weak we are, how strong God is, how proud we are, how condescending God is, how erring we are, and how infallible God is, how changing we are, and how immutable God is, how provoking we are, and how forgiving God is. So we observe here how in us there is only ill, 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 and how in him there is only good, good. So yet our ill but draws his goodness forth, and still he bless us. Oh, what a rich contrast is that. Now, secondly, sin seeks to do what? Sin seeks to enter. Sin seeks to enter. Grace shuts the door. Sin tries to get the mastery of us. But grace, which is stronger than sin, resists and will not permit it. Sin gets us down at times and puts its foot on our neck. But grace comes in to the rescue. Sin comes up like Noah's flood. But grace rides over the tops of the mountain, like the ark. So these are all the things that sin can do for us if we allow sin to enslave us. Do not suffer from spiritual poverty. It is your own fault, for he gives more grace. If you have not got it, it is not because it is not to be had, but because you have not gone for it. Now, Apostle James went further to say, God resists the proud. And what does he really mean? Why will God resist the proud? At the same time, James reminds us that this grace only comes to the humble. Grace and pride are eternal enemies. They don't mix at all. Pride demands that God bless me in light of my merits, whether real or imagined. That is what pride do. Pride, pride, pride boasts. Pride feels that I demand. It feels that I'm entitled to that God should bless me in light of my merits, in light of my achievement, whether it is real or imagined. But grace will not deal with me on the basis of anything in me, good or bad, but only on the basis of who God is. One, James used a powerful word in the phrase, resist the proud. He says himself in battle array against him. God resisted the proud. Seated himself in battle array against such, above all other sorts of sinners as invaders of his territories and forages of plunderers of his chief treasure. That is how God looked with disdain on the proud people. But he gives grace to the humble. It isn't as if our humility earns the grace of God. No. 
Humility merely puts us in a position to receive the gift he freely gives. And then he said, therefore, submit to God. And how do you submit to God? In light of the grace offered to the humble, there's only one thing to do, submit to God. And this means to order yourself under God, to surrender to Him as a conquering king and start receiving the benefit of His reign. Total surrender to God. One, it is a wonder that the world does not submit to God. The world in which we are living today does not submit to God. I have heard much of the rights of man, but it were well also to consider the rights of God, which are first, highest, surest, and most solemn rights in the universe and lie at the base of all other rights. And this brings us again, or reminds us of the, our general Basia, the time he was preaching, he, he said, God first, your family second, and your church third. Put God first, and that is what he said, and that's what Apostle James is saying here. He said, Alas, great God, how art thou a stranger even in the world which thou hast thyself made? How has God become a stranger? I ask myself too. Uh, all of us, we, in, in the world is, is gradually drifting away from God. And thy creatures who could not see, if thou hast not given them eyes, look everywhere except to thee. The creatures that God has created that give that God gives eyes to. They don't look for God, they look anywhere, they look everywhere. And look everywhere else except to thee. And then creatures who could not even think if you have not given them minds. They think of all things except thee. The scientists. They think about all these things, and if God has not even given them the mind to think, they will not be thinking about about about, about uh, 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 ways to condemn God to say that there's no God. And not, they they will not be thinking to fabricate other story about the creation. And that is what the, uh, 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 Apostle James is saying here. And being who could not live if thou did not give them in being. Forget thee utterly, or if they remember thy existence and see thy power, are foolhardy enough to become thy foe. They see the rain, they saw the thunder. They couldn't find any explanation for the thunder. They couldn't find any explanation for the volcano. They even try as much as possible to debunk the Red Sea. That it was it was due to a seasonal algae or algae, you know, one of these uh, things that uh, the vegetables uh, that, that grew in the Nile. And this is the world today. The world today is drifting away from God. And if you were a tyrant, if God was a tyrant, it might be courageous to resist. But since He is a Father, it is ungrateful to rebel. Instead. We should, there are some reasons why we should submit to God. Why do we have to submit to God? We should submit to God because He created us. We should submit to God because His rule is good for us. We should submit to God because all resistance to him is full time. We should submit to God because such submission is absolutely necessary to salvation. And why? Jesus Christ said to the proud, he said, when, when the Pharisees they were asking him, he said, those that are whole, no need of a physician. But those that are sick, he said, I did not come because of those that are whole, but that come because of sinners to bring them to repentance. 
So submission to God, because submission is absolutely necessary to salvation, otherwise we cannot be saved. And then we should submit to God because it is the only way to have peace with God. There is nothing we can do without God. You take, life, you take God out of your life, you are dead. You are just a living ghost. And then three say, I desire to whisper one little truth in your ear. And I pray that it may startle you. You are submitting even now. You say, not I. I am Lord of myself. I know you think so, but all the while you are submitting to the devil. The verse before us hints as this, Submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If you do not submit to God, you will never will resist the devil. And you will remain constantly under the tyrannical power which shall be your master. God or devil? For one of these must, no man is without a master. You, can't, you, you cannot serve two masters. It's either you serve God or you serve devil. And resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. So, so which means that even though the devil is his spirit, we cannot see him, and he's an angel, and we think he's powerful, he's a demon. But, but Apostle James is telling us that even as human mortals, we can still resist him, and he will flee from us. But how can we do that? <coughs> how can we? Are we more powerful than, than demons? Let us see now. Is it to solve the problems of carnality? And the strife it causes, we must also resist the devil. What do we mean by that? To, to solve the problems associated with the flesh. We take a decision which is not of God in the flesh. We do things that are ungodly because it is in the flesh. That is what it means, that to solve the problems of carnality. That is the problems that we that that we that we cause upon ourselves without putting God first, or without putting God in everything that we do, or in anything that we do. And the strife it causes the problem, the, con the confusion it causes us. We must also resist the devil. And this means to stand against the devil's deception and his efforts to intimidate. As we resist the devil, we are promised that he will flee from us. So it is a promise. So it's not it's not just a, 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 um, an assumption. It is a promise by Jesus Christ that he will flee from us. Significantly, James does not recommend that demons should be cast out of believers by a third party. Instead, James simply challenges individuals, Christians, to deal with Satan as a, a conquered foe who can and must be personally resisted. In other words, Satan is not something that, that a third party can drive us for us. Even though we can pray to God, we can pray to Jesus Christ to save us, because Jesus Christ, in, 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 among the, the, the uh, passages is give us in the in the in the, uh, uh, the Lord's prayer when the disciples ask him to just to pray. He said, he, he, he said, the Lord, he said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He said, save us from evil. Save us from temptation. So 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 that said that we can pray that prayer, but at the same time we have to make an effort ourselves to resist it there because we cannot be re re reciting the Lord's prayer. And at the same time, we are not taking care of ourselves. So that is what the, uh, uh, Apostle James is saying here. That he who, in the terrible name of Jesus, opposes even the devil himself is sure to have speedy and glorious conquest. He flees from that name and from his conquering blood, the name of Jesus. 
when you when 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 you, when, when you uh, <clears throat> lead your prayer with in, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and that's why they said that name alone is sufficient for you. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every eye will confess that Jesus is Lord. They said the, even the Satan will run from you by the name of that name of Jesus, name of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, today when you listen to the uh, prayers going on in the White House, in the, in the, in the capital, in, in any of these uh, um, today's world powers, the pastor will pray, but he will never end his prayer with in Jesus' name we pray. He will say, we thank you, Lord, we pray in your name. And say, Jesus is out of their life. They are afraid to mention the name of Jesus. Then number two says, resist comes from two Greek words, stand and against. You stand against. James tells us to stand against the devil. Satan can be set running by the resistance of the lowest believer who comes in the authority of what Jesus did on the cross. Resist by faith and the rest of the spiritual armor Resist by faith and the rest of the spiritual armor. As Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, 13 to 14, he said, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and stand. Stand. Stand firm with the, with the best... With, uh, uh, with the belts <coughs> faith always around your waist and then the breast of righteousness so what apostle what apostle james was i mean apostle paul was telling us here is that we can we, we can resist the devil where we put on the armor of god and this was the this was bringing us back again to the sermon i once gave about the armor of God. And when you look at the whole uh, um, pieces of matter that, that, they, they, that they put together, you have the breast of plate, I mean, the belt around your waist, you, you, you have the, the breast plate, and you, you, you have the helmet, you have everything, and then you have the sword, you have the, the, the shield. But what do they really mean? And, and 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 that efficiency six starts with the uh, with the waist the, the the waist belt of truth the waist belt of truth that is you have to, is, is is like putting on your belt around your waist. So also, what is the, the waist belt of truth? Let me remind you again the, the historical background. At the time that the uh, that the, the 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 waist belt of truth was was. Uh, in vogue. You see, as I explained during my sermon, in the olden days, it was generally believed that the stomach, which houses the intestine or the bowel, was thought to be the seat of the emotions. And this is from where one feels it. You feel your emotion from your from your stomach, not from the heart. It is from where we get the saying about God feelings. The, the popular saying is God feeling. That truth makes the waist belt of truth a vital armor for our defense. The truth is what we use to protect ourselves from an emotional response to the lies of the devil. If you know the truth, it will set you free. How many times have we felt like we are far from God, where we knew we were in right standing with Him. Or we feel like God has forsaken us and left us. And this is where the truth of God's written word protects us from a wrong emotional response. Our feelings will lie to us, but the truth of God's written word will not lie to us. By wrapping our emotional core in the truth, 
we are protected from the lies the enemy speaks directly or indirectly to our emotional core. It's very important. If you don't know the truth, if you, don't know, if you are not versed in the word of God, or if you don't know the truth, when you feel depression, sometimes you want to commit suicide. When you are down, you feel God has forsaken you. You give up. You take to drugs, you take to alcohol. You surrender yourself and that is what the devil wants you to do. To give up on yourself. But when you know the truth, you know that God will never forsake you because he has already promised that I will never forsake you. And why is, is that important to know, you may ask. Because the truth is the armor we use to protect ourselves from an emotional response to the lies of the evil. Again, how many times were you made to feel like you were far from God when you knew you were right in standing with Him? Or have you felt like God has forsaken you and left you even though you know Scripture says that He will never leave or forsake you? And this is where the truth of God's written word protects you from a wrong emotional response. And then the second one that Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians, the two armory that you must never allow to depart from you is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness, it protects the vital organ of the lungs of the lungs and the heart because in the Bible times there are these are where the spirit was thought to be located in the in the olden days and even up to today we feel that the, the spirit is located in the heart and in the lungs and it is truth in the spiritual realm too so there are two reasons. First, the breath of life was given by God directly into the lungs. Life, as mentioned in scriptures, being our eternal or spiritual life. As we read in Genesis 2, 7, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his noses the breath of life, and man became a living being. And second, the Hebrew names for Holy Spirit means breath of God. And this is what God righteousness protects. The enemy of your spirit is known as the accuser of the brethren. As we are told in Revelation 12, 7 to 12. A lot of people believe that Satan accuses us to God. A lot of people, they believe that Satan is accusing us to God. But the truth is that God, does, God knows who we belong to and what we do, both right and wrong. He doesn't need Satan to accuse us to him. Satan does not accuse us to God. He accuses us to ourselves by knowing that there is nothing we can do to obtain righteousness outside of what Jesus did for us and that we have accepted his righteousness. We are protected from this trick of the enemy as well. Not just that trick, but any acquisition of the enemy, those who choose to be controlled by him, can make against us. We are protected by God's righteousness as our breastplate. As a leader in the church, you will get people accusing you, you get people intimidating you, you get people telling lies against you, you will get, because Satan is going to use people that are close to you, to shake your faith, to, dis to disrail you, to disband, I mean, to, to disorganize you. But unless you wrap yourself up with that uh, 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 um, uh, belt around your emotional core, you will fall prey. So you must never allow them to intimidate you at all because you have the armor of God around you. And that is what we are saying tonight. So we should submit to God. Why? Because we have already said that He created us. So, and He will flee from you as to that particular assault in which you resist Him. 
So a famous ancient uh, uh, ancient Christian writer named Amos wrote, "The devil can wrestle against the Christian, but he cannot pin him. The devil can wrestle against a Christian, but he cannot pin us down." If you remember again the story of Job, Satan he used to go to God because he was he's an angel. So so one day he was he went to go and visit God and God said, Where, where have you been? He said, I've been to I've been to the world, to the earth, roaming uh, uh, the world. And God said, Did you see my servant Job. He said, yes, I saw him. And God said, I trust him. He said, Are you, you, I mean, why would you not trust him? He said, why, why would Job not be faithful to you? Why well, you give him everything? You give him wealth? You give him children? You give him cow? You give him animals? You give him essay? You give him everything? Why would he not worship you? Take away everything that you have given to him. He, he, he will deny you. He will accuse you. God said, no. Okay, give me permission. Give me permission. I want you to notice that one. You see, because God has already built a hedge around Job, around his children, around his animals, around his property. And that is what we should be praying for, for God to build a hedge around us. When you, when, when you walk with God, God will come to you and build a hedge around you. And when God built a hedge around you, there's no arrow of the enemy that can penetrate through that hedge. It's not that Satan could not attack Job, but he didn't have the authority, he didn't have the power because God has already built, it's just like, the, like, like the, the, the shell of an egg and the yolk is you and me. But nothing can penetrate that shell. And that's why Satan has to take permission from God that let me touch him. Open that, op, op, open the, the hedge for me. Let me let, let, let me get to him. God said, okay, I'll give you permission to go to him. But I did not give you his soul. And we all read the story. We all know the story. Satan tempted him. He took everything, killed his children, destroyed his house, destroyed everything. He was left naked. His friends accused him of denying God. His wife told him, deny your God, forsake your God so that we can get money again. He said, no, I will not. I will not deny God. <coughs> and then Satan was, was ashamed. And God doubled everything that he has lost. So what we are saying tonight is that Satan, no matter how powerful he may be, no matter how terrible it may be, it cannot penetrate you. It cannot get you unless you, 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 you lose your faith in God, you doubt God, or you forsake God, or you, 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 you choose to, uh, to, to adopt the wisdom of this world. And you think you can save yourself. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. The call to draw near to God is both an invitation and a promise. It is no good to submit to God's authority and to resist the devil's attack and then fail to draw near to God. We have it as a promise. God will draw near to us as we draw near to Him. It is a promise. And God never fails. When a soul sets to seek God, God sets out to meet that soul so that while we are drawing near to Him, He is also drawing near to us. Well, what does it mean to draw near to God? Let us consider them in these few ways. It means to draw near to God in worship, praise, and in prayer. Like I said in the first video, no wonder Pastor Mana is very, very much a laying emphasis on praise and worship every Sunday. 
you will not even allow us even to cut down the hours or the minutes in which the praise and worship must sing because here if he, he knew that praise and worship is also a form of worship to God. So it means to draw near to God in, in worship, praise and in prayer. And that brings me again to this question. If that praise and worship means so much to us, it means that you cannot just put anybody there to come and lead the praise and worship. Anybody to lead the praise and worship must be somebody that is also spiritually led. A man cannot just come or spend all night at the clubhouse drinking beer, mingling with prostitutes and then in the morning dress and come to church and, and, and then they stand up and come and give us praise and worship to, to lead the praise and worship. The Holy Spirit will not move in such a person. Same thing goes for the woman. So which means that anybody that will pose that to lead us in praise and worship, we must make sure that this person is, is has a relationship with God, not just anybody. And then, then it means to draw near to God by asking counsel of God. To draw near to God is mean by asking counsel of God. What does that mean? Because I asked that question. I said, I said, how do we how, how do we draw counsel of God? Because I can remember uh, uh, that vividly in the Old Testament, they they have something, the priests have something like a we call effort. <coughs> and if they are going to go to war or they are going to do anything, they will ask the priest, ask the ask God through the effort, which is kind of divination uh, truth. But we don't have that one now. So do we still ask counsel of God? I asked them, I asked that question, Pastor Mana, all of them, they told me that yes, that that the Holy Spirit gives us, like Sister Khadija Kalbo said, the Holy Spirit in us is a comforter. And that is a substitute for the effort, for the divination that we will, will, will have been running to because the Holy Spirit is inside everybody. All you have to do is to sit down and meditate and, and meditate, think about what you want to do, the Spirit will tell you whether it is right to do, it's not right to do, or it is safe to go, or it is not safe to go. The Holy Spirit is always there to guide you. So that, like Pasmana said, he said, we are always, always in cancer, asking counsel of God, consciously or unconsciously. Then, it then, it then to draw near to God, it means in enjoying communion with God. In enjoying communion with God. Then I ask that question again, how do you enjoy communion with God? We are all living today in a, in a, in a, in a busy world, in a jet age, in a hustle, by the time we finish the hustle and buzzle of the day, we are tired. The alarm clock will ring at, seven, at six o'clock, we have to clock in for work at 7.30. We are already rushing. We, we, we prepare breakfast and sandwiches. We go, jump inside the car, room to the work. At the work, how many people pray? How many people sit down to pray? Because we are too busy. And they must not even catch you praying in, in your office or that you'll be fired. And then, then in the evening, you are tired, you are coming back home. You're coming back home, you have so many things to do at home. You have to be on prayer line, you have to be on this. So by the time you finish, by 10, by 10 o'clock, you are tired. And all you want to do is just to go back to bed. And even the weekend that we don't work, we still occupy ourselves doing something. So how do you now enjoy communion with God? Because that was what I was asking. Because in those days, in the I mean, in the Garden of Eden, they had communion with God. God would come down during the evening time to meet Adam and Eve before the fall. And one one day when God came, He couldn't find them. Adam, where are you? He said, "I'm here. I, 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 I'm ashamed to appear to you." God said, "What? You are ashamed? Have you eaten out of the fruit that I ask you not to eat?" Who told you? Say I, I, I cannot come to you because I'm naked. Because say, why? Who told you you are naked? 
So God was having communion with people. God was having communion with all the even God had communion with uh, 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 Elisha. God had communion with Jacob. God had communion with the Lord people with Abraham. So where can we find God? How, how can we have communion with God? That is the question I ask. Because Elijah thought after after he ran away from uh, uh, persecution of uh, uh, Jezebel, he thought he could find God in the wild wind. God was not there. He thought he could find God in the storm. God was not there. He thought he could find God in the in the, in the, in the, in the eruption of the volcano. God was not there. Until he entered into a cave, a, a, a still place where was so gentle place. He had the voice of God. So where can we find God? And the, the, the type of example that I gave was that when I was uh, in, my, in, my, in my younger days, I used to drive to the seafront, to the bar beach. Around 10 o'clock at night, I would sit down there in front of the, the bar beach. I would sit down for one hour, cross my leg, just watching the wave, listening to the wave. And I could hear the voice of God. I could hear, even though it's not every time that I think about God. Because I, 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 sometimes I think about my worries. But that is the only way. I, and, and then also, I, 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 in those days, I used to have a, a special place in my, in my room where I would lock myself up there. But we can't do that today. The wife is there. The children are there. Television, everything is over there. And that's why I'm saying that in my own case, I'm lucky. I don't have a wife anymore. I don't have children to, to scream all over the place anymore. So if I cannot have communion with God, then, then there is my fault. So, then, then to draw near to God in the general cause and in the terror of life. So now, <clears throat> what we are now saying now is, is that in one way, this text illustrates the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, God told Moses to not come any closer to the burning bush and take off his shoes. Like Keda Kagbo explained to us, communion with God. Moses had communion with God. Under the new covenant, God says to the sinner, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Now the ground, because one thing is, like Ida Kagbo said, God told Moses, take off your shoes because where you are standing is a holy ground. So in the Old Testament, you have to go up to the mountains, you have to go somewhere that is considered to be a holy ground to have communion with God. And I may like also to suggest that that was the reason why they brought the Ark of the Covenant to the inner, inner temple so that they can have communion with God. But that is gone, is, is, is past now. We are now in the New Testament. So, so what, what, what is now representing that holy ground? for us to communicate or to have communion with God. You see, now the ground between God and the sinner has been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. And we can come close to God on the basis of that blood, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has been sprinkled on that ground, which has brought us to, to be closer to God. Whether you're wearing your shoe or you're not wearing your shoe does not matter. Because the blood of Jesus has sanctified that ground. So this also shows us what God wants to do for the sinner. It doesn't say, draw near to God and He will save you. No. He said, draw near to God and He will forgive you. It's after he has forgiven you that he will save you. Though both of those are true. 
Because if God forgives you, He automatically saves you. But what God really wants is to be near man to Him, to have a close relationship and fellowship with the individual. God wants to have fellowship with the individual. From the rest of the ch chapter, we see the result of drawing near to God. What are the benefits of drawing near to God? Drawing near to God helps us to resist the devil. Drawing near to God helps us to become pure. Drawing near to God helps us to sorrow for sin. How do we sorrow for sin? When you draw near to God, your conscience will tell you that you have sinned and you feel, you, 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 you feel sorrow in your heart. We have seen such example in the Bible. Drawing near to God helps us to speak well of other people. And drawing near to God helps us to think of eternal things. How do we think of eternal things? We don't think about worldly things, worldly things all the time. You spend time to God, you can think of eternal things. And that's what Jesus Christ was telling Nicodemus. That if you don't understand the, the signs of what is happening, physical, in the physical ethereal, I mean, in the physical world, how can you understand the things that are happening in the heaven? You cannot think of eternal things at all. So cleanse your heart, you sinners, and purify your heart. You double-minded. Who are double-minded? People with wavery faith. People that are blowing hot and cold. The people that Jesus Christ said, I will spill you out. Lament and mourn and weep. As we draw near to God, we will be convicted of our sin. So we lament and mourn and weep as appropriate under the conviction of sin and we are compelled to find cleansing at the cross. We mourn, we lament and mourn and weep. The typical example was Apostle Peter. What did the Bible tell us? After he, he when, when, when his eyes were down on him that he has betrayed Jesus Christ, he ran out of that out of that place where Jesus Christ was being uh, interrogated. He did not go to go and commit suicide. He wept. He wept. He cried that he has betrayed the master. But we were told that Jesus Christ said, I've already prayed for you. So that, so that he, he would not follow the path of Judas Iscariot. Because Judas Iscariot did not repent. He went to go and hang himself. So the word used for sinner is amatolos, which means the hardened sinner, the man whose sin is obvious and notorious. And in using terms like lament and mourn and weep, James speaks in terms of the Hebrew prophet's language about the anguish of repentance. The anguish of repentance. When you repent your sin, you become sad. And that's why God loved David. Because they went, they, David, David repented, he, he wore sackcloth. He cried, he repented his sin. God forgave him. And the same thing with Ezekiah too. And even Ahab, of all people, Ahab, of all people, after, after, after Jezebel, Killed, um, <clears throat> uh, 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 took the, 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 the vineyard and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Elijah appeared to him. He repented, he walked so cloth, he was sad, and God saw it. God said, Okay, I'm not going to uh, 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 finish him during his lifetime, but uh, during the lifetime of his son. So that is what we are saying. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. As you come as sinners before the Holy God, not as self-righteous 
religious as Jesus explained in Luke 18, 10 to 14. Self-righteous religionists like the Pharisee. He came to the temple, he was beating, he was beating his chest. I am I am paying my tithes, I'm praying five times a day. I am not like that a, a, a publican, the, 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 the task collector behind me. The publican could not even come into the church. He, he stood near the gate with, with his head bowed. He said, I am a sinner, please forgive me, Father. But Jesus Christ said that the man that sinner went home saved than the, than the Pharisee. So that's what Jesus Christ is saying here. Then he will lift you up because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble and grace the unmerited favor of God always lifts up. In this passage, James has powerfully described both the duty and the blessing of repentance. Then I ask a question again. And that question which I asked was about <clears throat> how does pride show up in our work? How does pride show up at our home? How does pride show up at our church? How does pride show up in our community? And why does God oppose people who are proud? And a lot of useful, useful answers were given to us tonight, which unfortunately the, the computer refused to, to, to record them. How do we, uh, uh, Dr. Osman Kago explain to us how pride can show up in our place of work? How we, we, we can become so proud that we we, we cannot appreciate anybody or anything. We just feel so much importance that we miss out. Even in our home. Even in our home, as, as he explained to us, a, a, many, many relationships have broken down. Mar many marriages have broken down. Simply because either the husband is so proud or the wife is so proud because he has, a, she has education or she has achieved something or she's, or she's getting a better salary than the husband. She becomes too proud, too arrogant to submit to her husband. And it has led to many broken marriages. And the same thing goes in the church too. Like Sister Kadiba Khadija explained to us, that some people in the church, you correct them, they feel too proud to take correction. We've all experienced this, that some pastors, you cannot correct them. It's not that you are correcting the pastors, but, but God is sending you to them. But you say, who are you to correct me? I'm a pastor. I'm a leader. I'm an elder in this church. How can you correct me? Why will God send a commoner like you? If God wants to correct me, he can send somebody higher than me or, or talk to me directly. But not you. And that reminds us again about Prophet Eli. Prophet Eli has served God for more than 90 years. When, when uh, Hannah brought uh, Samuel at the age of five, and that tender age, maybe eight or ten years of age, God called Samuel. Prophet Eli realized that it was God that was calling Samuel. He didn't say, what? Why would God call Samuel and not me? that I've been serving him for almost 90 years of my life. But what did he say? He said, go and sleep again. When he calls you again, he didn't say when God calls you, he said, when he calls you again, tell him, speak on the Lord, for that servant heareth. He knew God wants to talk to him. Because in those days, there are visions and also God talks directly with us. Talks physically, you can hear, physically talk, not 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 in, in, in vision or anything. God talks to him somewhere, somewhere. He said, speak on Lord for that servant hearing. And God talked to him. 
So in humility, he asks Samuel, tell me what he has told you. Do not hide anything from me. So that was the question. So that, so that this, uh, 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 this uh, 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 precious saints of Mount Zion Fellowship, Joy Pastor Mana, Dr. Osman, uh, the, uh, Sister Khadija, and uh, our bank, all of them, they gave us very, very useful answers tonight. Then I asked them a question again. That we <clears throat> but what is the difference between pride and the sense of uh, uh, accomplishment? What is the difference between pride and a sense of accomplishment? You see, because it is very, very easy to, 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 to sort of mistake the, the, the two together. Because one thing, the, the, the type of example I first asked them is, is that, sense, what does it mean by, by, by sense of accomplishment? You feel proud, definitely. If you, after you read, you struggle, 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 all your life, and, you, and then, then, then you, you get your PhD. Your PhD will make you feel proud. Your mother will be proud of you. Your father will be proud of you. And you also feel pride in yourself that I've accomplished this. But is it a crime? So that was the question I was asking. That What is the difference between pride and accomplishment? A sense of accomplishment. And I said, I had a cargo explained to us. You say pride is when 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 you 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 accredited that achievement to yourself. That is, I got my PhD because I work hard, not because God helped me to do it. But sense of accomplishment is that I was able to accomplish this hype through the grace of God. So in other words, the praise is not to you but to God. So anything you accomplish in this life is true God. So that is the difference and, and that the, the mistake that Nebuchadnezzar make. Because Nebuchadnezzar stood in, on top of, of his building, he, he looked at the glory of Babylon, he said, this is my achievement. I built this, I built that, I built that, I built that, this is my achievement. He didn't, he, he didn't uh, uh, accredit God for, for this achievement. What did God do to him? God turned him into a beast. For almost seven years, he was eating grass. Not until eventually he was humble, he looked up to, uh, to, unto the sky, he realized that only one God to be humble. Only one God to praise before God now restore him back to his kingdom. So, so that's the difference between pride and a sense of um, accomplishment. So, it was, it was a beautiful evening that we had. And then, um, we thank God. I want to thank God for, for everybody that uh, helped us tonight. And uh, we hope uh, when, when they start uh, next Wednesday, we will also be uh, around to discuss verses uh, from 11. The solution for strife, get right with other people. The solution is get right with God, but to next week is going to be get right with other people. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Can we pray? Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, for giving us this opportunity, O oh Lord, to learn your word. We thank you, Father Almighty, for everything you've done for us. We give you glory, we give you honor, O oh Lord. We beseech you, O oh Lord, to let every word that has been said tonight find further ground in our hearts. All glory and adoration belongs to you, O Lord. Save us, O Lord, Father mighty. Do not let us be here as alone, but do us of thy word. We pray, O Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.